I'm really excited to get this kicked off with Dr. Maria Sampalas. We actually talked about this a while back, and uh, uh, she was the very first person that I reached out to, and she kind of came up with this really cool concept for a COPE-approved course, and uh, I'm, I'm so excited to learn from her. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maria Sampalas. Dr. Maria Sampalas practices optometry in Cranston, Rhode Island, where she uses cutting edge technology to diagnose and treat refractive errors and ocular disease. As a graduate of the New England College of Optometry, Dr. Sampalas also trained in fitting contact lenses for all prescriptions. She was named Young OD of the Year in Rhode Island in 2016 and Most Influential Women in Optical in 2019. She serves on the Rhode Island State Board of Health and lectures on the United, in the United States on various topics within optometry. In her spare time, she enjoys spending time with her two daughters and watching sports. Dr. Simpolis, it's a pleasure to have you kicking off today's Elevating Women in Eye Care event. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It's such an honor to be here today. Um, first, uh, here are my financial disclosures uh, for the presentation today. And um, today it's an honor to speak about gender inequalities in eye care. So first, uh, I love this quote here. It, um, you know, we raise, I raise my voice, not so I shout, but so that those without a voice can be heard. Um, we cannot succeed when half of us are uh, held back. So I love that, that quote there. I think it's very permanent for today's presentation. Uh, empowerment occurs when we come together for an issue to really build equality. So here are some women in optometry facts. Um, the first woman optometrist was Dr. Staten in 1899. So uh, the first optometrist there, um, Dr. Staten was a pioneer who decided to just write a new chapter in, in history. Um, she was the first woman to obtain optometry license in that period where the presence of uh, just professional women in this field was reduced to um, you know, just 2%. So here are some other eye care facts. In 1976, there are only 2% uh, women optometrists practicing and it's increased about 44% in 2020. Uh, five uh, women now are become uh, on the board of trustees out of 11 for the American Optometric Association. Academia leadership, 43% of uh, chief academic officers are female, 21% on the members of board of directors, executive committee for the ASCO. Um, so that has been an advancement in, in our uh, profession there. Here are some other uh, facts. Uh, Dr. Axon, uh, Axford, um, first female president of AAO in 1993. Dr. Carlson, the first president for American Optometric Association in 20, uh, 2011. Uh, Dr. Coyle, first president of uh, a a ASCO in 2013. Just found out now from Women Optometry Magazine, first uh, president optometrist for uh, Pacific uh, university, which is something to be applauded. It's it's great to see those things. Dr. Hoppy, first editor of ASCO Journal Optometric Education in 2005. And just globally here, um, the uh, Royal Australian and New Zealand uh, College of Ophthalmologists appointed their first female in 2020. Um, and then Academy of Ophthalmology first president, Susan Day in 2005. Um, so you know, we go back to Dr. Uh, Staten, but uh, in 1819, 1899, uh, Dr. Burroughs was the first uh, woman to practice ophthalmology in the United States in the late 1800s, where in that point where women only comprised about 10% of practicing physicians. Um, but in the early 1900s, it was a strong opposition for women practicing medicine. And uh, women were a minority at that point um, throughout the uh, you know, 1900s. In fact, the profession didn't really grow until the 1970s. So if we go back to looking at Dr. Staten in 1899, if we look back at optometry, it took nearly a hundred years to get females in leadership positions. Um, so we need to celebrate these women who've really broken barriers in our industry and made it easier for the next generation of ODs. Um, so today we'll kind of discuss some of the gender disparities 
and how to overcome them. So the first thing I would like to talk about is gender pay gap. Uh, it's real and it has a dramatic impact on our industry. And it's really hard to believe that this is still an issue in 2022 with the entering class of 2024 being 69% female. So I wanna kick off a first poll question here um, to see what the audience thinks. What years of experience do you think has the greatest gender gap, gender pay gap? Year one to five, year six to 15, year 16 and beyond. People are answering the poll. I'll leave it up for just a few more seconds. Here are your results. All right, great. So it's here, it's, it's kind of mixed in. So let's go to the slides here. So here was a study uh, taken um, by Women in Optometry Magazine. And it just asked that. So the, um, it illustrates the average income by experience, males versus females. And you can kind of see here that the gender gap starts at a uh, year up to year five at the beginning. But as the years go on, it gets even larger. Um, so we'll, we'll go through some of these reasons. And um, you know, some of these reasons can be gender bias, male dominated culture, leadership gap, and many of other things. But if you kind of look at this, not just by five year increments, but over a career of 30 years, you know, the disparity over 30 years can be an income um, disparity of almost $600,000. Um, and there's other things that contribute to that as well um, that are more. So that's, that's a big figure here to, to look over a 30 year career. So here's another poll question. Uh, do you think gender wage gap exists region and practice type? The poll is launched and I'll just give it a few more seconds and share the results. Yes, all right. So we have a good majority there. So yeah, th there is. Um, here is a study done by the College of Optometry, University of Missouri. Some great ODs worked on this, Dr. Ham, Dr. Simpson. They reviewed data from 366 optometrists, all that worked full-time, were not practice owners or residency trained. So there's a lot of interesting data that compa compares this. But what the data showed was that salary wage gaps were seen the most in the West, 13%. Northeast, 10% disparity, and South, 9% disparity. Uh, by practice type, it reported the largest wage gap was commercial practice, followed by medical setting and private practice. So the commercial practice disparity was about almost 17%, uh, medical practice, 12%, and private practice, 7%. So this issue is not just here in the US, but over in the UK, women ODs make about 15% less than male ODs. Well, in doing some research in Australia, the biggest issue facing optometrists, female optometrists is equality. So it remains a strong gender inequality when it comes to pay, career advancement and leadership opportunities, according to Australia, Optometry Australia. So this is a global problem. And the wage gap doesn't just affect ODs, but ophthalmologists and opticians as well. So you can see here that women uh, ophthalmologists about 25% of their industry. According to American Academy of Ophthalmology, uh, the wage gap is about $27,000 from starting salaries. Some things to account for that are lower, you know, women starting a lower subspecialties, choosing academic mode instead of private practice. But women are over, underrepresented in surgical subspecialties. They perform less procedure, uh, pr procedural work. They have uh, fewer operating hours than men. Uh, patterns of consultation and treatment could contribute to some of this. Women tend to, um, you know, take more time with their patients. Um, and, you know, just, you know, looking at data with Medicare, uh, women ophthalmologists see fewer patients um, and get less money from Medicare. 
And according to, you know, Academy of uh, Ophthalmology, salary differences persist um, even by controlling demographic, educational, and practice variables. So here is some data on opticians. We, I mean, we work with opticians in our industry. Um, so I think I thought it was important to put it in here. Um, according to Glassdoor, it's about 17% less than their male colleagues. And, um, you know, bonus structures is less um, as well. So just besides just income on, on, on salary on this, um, I thought to take a look at this, you know, thinking outside the box, it just doesn't affect primary income, but also there's a secondary wage gap. 401k match, social security, sign-on bonuses. Um, when you think of 401k match, employers, you know, that provide the benefit, um, if it's less for, uh, you know, if women are making less on their salaries, the match is different, right? Um, a woman making $20,000 less a year, um, her 401k uh, would be 7k less over five years, um, and that's just deposit. And we're not even talking about uh, compact, uh, compound interest. Social security benefits, um, you know, optometrists make a lot more, but maybe this is pertaining to um, opticians. So social security benefits are calculated over lifetime earnings. So if a woman earns less over her course of her career, it's a lower base uh, earnings upon social security benefits. And then sign on bonus. So I have reviewed um, contracts uh, for optometrists in the industry. Um, and fa have found that the same contract that was presented to one uh, male versus female, uh, the different salaries were the same, things were the same. The only difference was a sign-on bonus where a male was presented a sign-on bonus where a female was not. Uh, so here's another interesting concept. I had promoted this in my group a while ago, um, the Corporate Optometry Facebook group, and just looked at, you know, does it affect self-employment? And um, a lot of optometrists said, hey, it's always how much you work, how hard you work. Um, but some, within the, the survey here was that we I found that uh, female optometrists were presented um, small setting uh, operations, maybe one operation where um, some men had multiple locations um, there. Um, so that, you know, multiple subleases. So uh, I, that is something to consider as well. And I think private uh, practice, um, I have some data here as well um, to kind of show you know, the, the, the wage gap here for self-employed. Now consider, you know, older practices, older uh, practices now selling. If there was, it was male dominated at one point, uh, how are they considering uh, to sell their practice? Are they looking for the best clinician, best business experience, highest bidder, or are some uh, factors determined, uh, predetermined notions of a person's ability based on gender? So here's the uh, data that I found in 2011 from Jobson and showed here that uh, practice owners, males were making about $160,000 versus $120,000 for females. So why did they, what did they find with the differential here? Um, some of the, this, they found more peak years between 12 to, 15, uh, 12 to 25 years. Um, the gender, Demographics have shifted over the last 20 years. Peak earnings have changed. Maybe women are less likely to go right into ownership right away if they start a family, or um, you know, less likely um, to start because of student loans. Um, and some of them have also found that um, to kind of balance everything out, uh, females might hire additional staff to help with uh, the admin tasks of of the business, uh, reducing net profit. So, you know, some practices in the past um, were based on numbers, data, um, where the, you know, less competition would be. Um, some practices now are based on being close to the home. I know I like having close to the home practice. There is some competition here, but I feel like it really um, based on the doctor and what their motivation is uh, in the past. So, um, and then, you know, is it possible to have um, some discrimination when negotiating a partnership and contract? Uh, maybe. I mean, I mean, it, it really depends on the senior partner and and, and what their, um, you know, view is. So here the, uh, there was, a, uh, you know, gender pay gap was very large. The disparity was large. So in the UK, they passed legislation. So the government's uh, gap figures are are very useful here on the extent of equality rights in the workplace and uh, senior um, positions which were often held by men in the UK. So 
Here, uh, the legislation shows that if you have employees of 250 or more, they have to calculate this and publish this every year. The data that I have is from 2020. Um, the next data for 2021 will be published in the next two weeks or so. So just taking a look here, because I think that, you know, optometry is global, but most of the decisions that are made sometimes are by big corporations um, outside of the U.S. So I thought that this was important here. Um, and just, you know, this data showed um, Luxottica in the U.K. at that point. They employed over, they, they had a small footprint at that point, but they had 900 associates in the U.K. Most of them were store-based roles and they were part-time. And women outnumbered men in most of the most of those roles, which was was uh, larger than what is normal uh, over there in the UK. And the roles were about two to one. So upper leadership was about 70% much higher than other companies. And if you can see here, the, the, the gender gap was only 8% from what we've seen in the past, about 15% here in the US. And um, just gender bonus here was much larger. So here, Vision Express reported that 74% um, of its employees were, um, were female, but it fell short to 43% of senior management teams. So 25% are aboard are female, and the gender pay gap here was about 23%. Uh, so it was much larger, uh, the, and the bon high bonus pay was about 76%. Um, which is off one time management here for, for senior management. And, and they have, um, you know, ways to um, help, um, you know, edge off this um, disparity and they had programs. So the, they, they have 78% of their females uh, in the game changer program here. So, and but since then, you know, Luxotic has purchased this company. Let's look at this here um, for, let me just turn my video back on, apologize here. I'm having a little trouble here, there we go. Okay, here we saw Specsavers, which is a global company, uh, very large in the, US, in the UK and Australia. They published their data here. And, and they have a unique proposition because they're franchise owners. Um, so that there is, is a little different to compare apples to apples. Um, but here they have a you know, leadership gap. Um, there is about 30% female and they broke it down into optical stores and um, you know, lab as well. So with Specsavers reports that uh, it's changed significantly over the last five years. Notably, the gap was about 35% and it's changed about 24% in the upper quartile, 24% female to 30% um, has changed. So a 6% increase in that. And, and they've taken activities to really include, to be a partner in global diversity and inclusion organization to, de to deliver unconscious bias and training, extending you know, flexible working schedules and a detailed uh, recruitment process to uh, help change this, uh, this uh, gap here. Here, so what can account for the gap? Um, <clears throat> so working less, working part-time, uh, not negotiating. A lot of females don't wanna negotiate. Uh, stereotypes about having a family, uh, work-life balance, and less leadership positions. Uh, stereotypes include, um, you know, being a mother, having le being less committed to the workforce. Women are penalized uh, for motherhood sometimes, and they don't even have kids. Employers may assume that females are are eventually going to have kids and want to cut their hours or leave the job entirely. And these stereotypes about mothers uh, potentially result in fewer opportunities for women and less professional development and advancement in the in the future. So here is, is a consequence of the gap besides just income, right? Um, so it is, you know, paying back student loans a longer period of time, 
uh, not contributing amount to retirement. Um, and, you know, having the burden of loans, having the financial issues can lead to imp- depression and anxiety, less likely to take risks because you're worried about those things. And then with, th- with that, then you're less likely to, you know, seek a leadership position to take the risk to do that to take the risk to purchase the private practice that you want or you know, be worry of financial burdens or, or that. So it's a cycle that causes women to take less risk and advancement into leadership positions because of fear of failure. And it's the consequences are career long consequences. So what can we do to overcome this gap and help younger females in our industry? So there is a, a lot of things that we can do um, to you know, have improvement. Uh, so here, look at, if you look at here, uh, it shows that you know, there's always ways to improve yourself, your skill set, your knowledge, you know, be, having a subspecialty. You know, right now there's an influx of doctors want to do myopia management. That has been um, something um, to you know, present to yourself to the practice as, as a, a way to improve the practice, to bring more revenue in. Um, so that has been something to kind of elevate yourself um, and, and show your value. The other thing, too, is to stay up to date. I mean, there's a lot of information, a lot of CE online that's free now, easy to access. Um, and then just like topics uh, in the industry. I mean, everyone's posting the latest information on social media. Uh, Vision Monday has been a great thing to kind of stay up to date of what's going on in the industry as well. And I always say, you know, you need to constantly market yourself. You know, no one's going to be an advocate for you, but you, right? Um, so you need to, you know, use your platform, use, you know, your, your, your status in your community, local or global, whatever the case is to promote what you're doing. And LinkedIn is, is I think, underutilized. I think it's a great medium to kind of show your experience, to, you know, show potential uh, employers what you do, what your expertise are. Um, and, you know, people are looking at that. People see that. And um, I think that's important as well, because you can also write articles on LinkedIn and things like that. So you have your own platform instead of just, you know, people say, I don't have time to build a website and things like that. But that's also important to have that information out there. You know, I, I would also, you know, try to find a female OD in, in a position where you see yourself in the last, in the next five years, in the next 10 years, ask them to be your mentor. Uh, you want to learn as much as you can to grow. Uh, you know, knowledge is really the key to your success. Um, and and I, I always found that I would always interview for different jobs, even if I think I didn't want it. Um, I would learn a lot of different things from this. One, I would learn uh, what others are offering um, for jobs and salary. Uh, you're networking. Two, three, you learn like how to negotiate. It's easier to negotiate if if with something if you're not like really wanting it per se, right? And it's easier now with, with uh uh, virtual world because you're not face to face, your uh, computer kind of separates you. So it might be more easier to, you know, say what you want and, and bring that up. So you're not nervous. And, and I mean, I think you've learned, I've learned so much over the years on just practice for practice for sale and things like that. And what, uh, you know, sellers are looking for and, and, you know, what they're offering in their practice to kind of know uh, which is the right practice for me or, or the right, um, you know, business opportunity for me. And then it also keeps you current, right? So that's also keeps you up to date. So when you want to go for that opportunity, you know what's out there, you know what people are offering. And, um, you know, a lot of doctors get comfortable. They start, you know, they, they'll first negotiate or they won't negotiate. They'll get a baseline salary and they'll never talk about it again, or they'll never bring up the conversation of a partnership again. So negotiating, a lot of females don't negotiate. The studies have shown that they don't. And, um, you know, you've worked hard for, you know, to, to get your license, to, to, to be an expert in your field. So know your capabilities, know your, your successes, know your skill set. Um, you don't want to be afraid to, you know, raise your hand um, and, you know, ask for something. Um, you want to understand, you know, what's out there, the, the, the data. There's a lot of data out there within um you know, the industry to kind of get you to know where you are on salary and income in that area. So that's important. Um, and then you want to know like the area trends. There are some, been some shortages recently. Um, so use that to your advantage. And then, you know, you want to have a positive, you know, attitude about it when you present. Um, that's always important. And what I found was negotiating, it was, you know, you have a contract, you can kind of go back and forth. And the easiest way to, to, to say something, if you're nervous to present it, is you can always ba- blame your lawyer 
um, to say on certain terms that you don't agree on that my lawyer uh, does not like this this clause does not like this 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 um, sentence here. Um, so that has been a way to help and kind of offset some of that nervousness. Um, negotiations in art, uh, it takes time to master and, and to feel comfortable. And um, the more information you know, the more comfortable you'll be. Um, so that that has been helpful. And, and you really have to advocate for yourself. No one's going to advocate uh, for you better than you. Um, so you have to be your own champion. And the worst case scenario in this is if if they say no, uh, and and that's fine if they say no. So you and then you just need to evaluate your options and and know you know what your next steps are. If you want to be there, if you if you're looking for another opportunity, another tip that I found was for, if, if for me to negotiate was it was easier for me to negotiate in September and October um, than it was in April May when new grads are coming out. Um, because by then in September, October, uh, most of those new grads have jobs. So there's less of a candidate pool. So um, it is something to kind of consider um, when uh, you're looking at negotiating your salary. So what employers can do to fix the, the wage gap? So I think it's not just you to fix it. I think employers need to, to improve as well. So there's three things. One is pay transparency. I think they should be publishing a, a, a gender pay gap reports. Open communication, um, pay just dis, uh, transparency should be the guide to help employers, you know, have you reached your next payroll, pay rate. So what, you know, here is the guide and what is the next thing that you need to do to get to that. Uh, employers should see that uh, where they stand compared to others in the industry by publishing um, a gender pay gap. I think that's important to make themselves competitive. And then open communication. So I think it should be okay. You shouldn't be penalized to talk to employees about uh, your salary or what your benefits are. And if you're not sharing, it only helps the employers. Uh, so here's a proposal, um, the Paycheck Fair Act Bill introduced in January of 2021. It passed the House uh, on April 15th and is placed in the Senate, uh, Senate uh, legislative calendar. So these things here that are presented in this, in this proposal are the three things that employers can do to improve. So it bans employers from asking job applicants what they made in previous job. It prevents employers from banning salary conversations. And it requires uh, employers to be more transparent about pay and to share the information with the Department of Labor and Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission. So how, how does private equity play a role in eye care and because we're seeing a lot of influx of, of private equity buying practices, and how does this affect females in the industry? So private equity trends, uh, usually, private equity trends are male dominated. According to the study here, women only make about 9% of leadership of senior positions and only 18% of the industry workforce. Um, data has shown just general Women are about 40%, start 40% of businesses, but only 2% of funding help women to start their own businesses from uh, venture capital uh, companies. And we saw that with the lead sponsor here showing that women are not uh, investors, but um, to help to, to show this too. So, so you know, the, 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 the challenges that we might face in the industry as the industry is changing, as we have an influx of private equity buying practices, if we have an influx of graduating females, how, how will this change? What will be some challenges that some women might face in a male dominated workplace? Um, so some might have social expectations and beliefs about females ability for leadership. There might be some uh, stereotypes, uh, might cause higher stress and anxiety for some females working um, maybe in this setting. Um, the lack of mentor and career development opportunities and sexual harassment. So what are some mechanisms that women use to cope with uh, maybe a male dominated workplace? So sometimes they distance themselves from other colleagues. They accept the normals of, of this behavior. Um, they might leave the practice as well and even just leave the industry as well. Um, but this occupational segregation, again, contributes to the gender pay gap. 
So this is the cycle back again here. And as we see that as the years go on, um, that the you know, gender gap is get, gets even wider. So we have a poll question here again. Among the world's largest 500 companies, what percentage of women are CEOs? And we'll just leave the poll question up a little bit longer for people to answer. Well, 66% said it was 5% and 31% 20%. So they're getting better at the poll questions as we go on. Um, yeah, uh, so, you know, gender pay gap data from these companies, they're, they're lagging behind, but it's because of the lack of leadership. So the two go hand in hand. Among the world's largest 500 companies, women are only 4% of, of CEOs. So, um, and then top uh, management positions, women are 7% of all executives in large and small scale organizations. And I think this pertains to optometry as well. Um, uh, as we, as you think about who is in leadership positions in the industry. And that the numbers don't lie. Uh, a lot of women are not decision makers. Um, globally, women only hold 24% of senior leadership positions. The U.S. lags behind by 21%, where China leads the way with 51%. And again, you know, 4% are CEOs. And just like federal judges, 66% are male. And here, you know, studies shown that 22,000 publicly traded organizations, 60% have no female boards. So we have females in leadership positions, but very few that are CEOs in the company. And I care. Um, so I can only think of only a few that are CEOs. I did reach out to different corporations to see if they'd give me some information on this. Some did reach out, uh, you know, contact back, some didn't. Um, but Bailey Nelson is a, can, a company in Canada and the UK. Uh, their executive committee is about 60, uh, 86% female. The support staff, 75%. Regional managers, 66%. Female lead ODs, 78%. Female, uh, Four Eyes, which is under Luxotic Umbrella, now they were purchased. 65% um, uh, is female and Four Eyes, um, you know, the store leaders are, are, are almost 80%. Um, and those have, hasn't been increased over the, over the last couple of years. They've been with the company over 20 years. Um, so that is, uh, you know, store leadership there for, you know, usually opticians. Uh, you know, and, and National Vision published some data and they said that, you know, they employ about 76% of females and that women hold 67% uh, of companies' management positions at the store level and above. And some other data here, uh, Warby Parker uh, hired about 71% females, OD leadership, 63%. So we are seeing some female, uh, you know, leadership positions in different corporations um, and, and, and trying to, you know, close that gap. So when asked about if gender was a question about leadership, the data shows that gender doesn't matter. So this here says that it's pretty equal. It doesn't matter. Uh, so if gender isn't an issue, why are so many women held back from these positions? One theory is that uh, the term glass ceiling. So it refers to the invisible barrier that keeps people from advancing in their workplace. You know you've reached it when lesser qualified individuals keep passing you by. So the, the glass ceiling keeps people from getting certain jobs despite them being qualified and deserving. It really uh, affects their career trajectory, status, and earning potential. So again, it kind of circles back to that gender pay gap as well. But it has, we have had shattered ceiling. There are plenty of women that are breaking barriers, shattering those ceilings. And, and, and so can you, right? Um, what can you do to, to help break that? You wanna have more career-focused conversations, 
Don't assume that somebody knows what you want, that somebody's going to um, bring you up or, 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 or say that you should apply for this job. You should be your own advocate. Um, identify areas of improvement. Everybody needs to improve. You're not the same person you were five years ago, and you're not going to be the same person from five years from now. So you always need to continually to improve if you want that position. Um, and then you need to take risks. I mean, you, you need to, you know, have untraditional uh, assignments to kind of, you know, grow and, 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 and kind of pave your own path. At, you know, ask for those stretch assignments, ask to do for more work, you know, speak up, don't be afraid to voice your opinion. People like that. Pe people want to see someone that wants to be a leader that wants to, you know, raise their voice and make change. And I think that's important. And if you find yourself that you're doing these things and not moving up in a company, then sometimes it's just, it's better to uh, move on to a different organization um, that sees your value and then you can move up in that rankings or take another position. Um, Cause I think that's important. And women continue to face these challenges and, and, they, and they finally break the glass ceiling. But women in leadership positions still face an uphill battle when it comes to these challenges and what sets them uh, for you know, failure and pushing them over the edge, which is a phenomenon called the glass cliff. The glass cliff can reinforce the harmful idea that women can't lead. So what happens is women kind of break through that glass ceiling and they get that position and they're really kind of sometimes brought in, the theory is they're brought in during tough times in an organization when things aren't going well. And they, they, they kind of go to a female for that stereotypic uh, female traits, um, such as like when a company's failing to, you know, be able to elevate people and bring people together. Um, so sometimes that is, is, is uh, one theory. So in other words, they managed to break through the glass ceiling just to be to, to the glass cliff. So think about who you thought was in the CEO pos leadership positions. And was it a company that was thriving or was it a company that was um, kind of not doing well and, and took on that, uh, that person took on that new position? So leadership positions in eye care. So let's take a look here um, in optometry and how this compares to the leadership gap in our industry. So we're finding that 70% of the graduating class are female over the last few years, yet women reflect a small majority of leadership roles. Leadership roles just go beyond just top management positions and, and as you know, CEOs or professional, uh, professional affairs committee and things like that, but also president of professional organizations, speaker opportunities, editorial positions, dean of position of college optometry, having multiple subleases, private practice purchases. Um, information that I, you know, did some research on from the Sunshine Act found that, you know, many KOLs or speakers and consultants in the industry are male. And then when you kind of just dig deep and see a little more that, you know, everyone's being paid the same and what their experience is, but the number of opportunities to speak were less for females. And in a world where presentations are virtual now and, and, and not traveling, and it, so there shouldn't be an issue for priorities and, and recommendations there. Um, so, and then also just researching crunch based data, um, just optical industry, um, on investments on, on doctors that start side businesses within the industry. Um, there is, again, this data is, is I think 2% of, of venture funded, just our female companies. It, apl it applies to optometry as well. So here is a study, uh, in 2014. 14, and um, the same thing here for our ophthalmologists, and they found that women main investigators were less likely to receive grants than men early in their career, and women op ophthalmologists also formed fewer industry connections and received less industry support. The study from American Medical Association, women are, are underrepresented in ac academic positions, editorial boards, uh, chairperson positions, residency program directors. Um, and what they found was a longer publishing career had a greater number of publications, higher academic rank, and associated with higher income. So that takes you back again to the gender pay gap, the leadership positions gap here. And it pertains to not just optometry, but also to ophthalmology as well. So let's go into identifying some of the barriers uh, to the leadership gap. 
So some of the some data here was shown that what are some big um, you know barriers to for women in a leadership position. So 40% said it was work uh, family barriers, 20% underinvestment in uh, in social capital, 25% uh, stereotypes, 10% organizational culture. So um, when you have gender biases and stereotypes against women, uh, you know, female leadership positions, aspirations, that affects it. Um, Some stereotypes, you know, women are punished for, um, you know, speaking up or bringing that on there. Um, and, and, and sometimes when there isn't a, a role model there to see, to kind of bring you up, it's hard to envision someone else, uh, taking on a position. <clears throat> so here are some barriers and, 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 and maybe some solutions and, and what we can do to help, um, lower that, um, leadership gap, you know, the, the training programs out there, you know, they're not enough. It's just, they're, you know, they're outdated solutions. Um, you know, optometry managers are aware of gender inequalities, but they don't understand how it works or how they can change it. They, you know, I had one conversation about this with somebody before the lecture and they, you know, he said, I don't see why there's any, there's more females out there um, than males right now in the industry coming in. So there isn't any inequalities. Um, and, and females, you know, they can't thrive in a workplace when they're having these, these barriers and there's male dominated culture and, and these gender um, biases. So it's hard to, to really, you know, expand. It really inhibits your growth. Um, so again, it, it goes back to the gender gay back, uh, gender pay gap because it hit occupational segregation really inhibits. So you're not asking for the next thing, right? And many companies have really started to change and evolve with uh, DEI division and, and expand diversity in the workplace. So I think that's important. I think we're on the right step, um, but I think there needs to be more change um, within our industry to help younger females um, come o- overcome these barriers. Some other barriers too that we've noticed, um, you know, females are, 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 are noticing less growth after uh, having children. If we go back to that first slide too, you can kind of see how it widens. Um, you know, the maternal bias in the industry, it's there. You can't have it all. You know, I've experienced it myself and I've been told, you know, you know, you might not want to take on additional work or something like that. You're too busy uh, taking on. And I think I'm the one to make that decision. Um, you know, you can't have a successful career and be a good mom. I think we had a lot of female role models that have done that. And, um, you know, female leadership positions to Kelly and I help, um, you know, understand that and, and think of it differently um, is, is if you can see it, you can be it mentality. And if we have someone to advocate for us to say, I am a leader in this and I've done this. Um, so can she, it, I think it helps uh, with that. So there are ways we can change misconceptions here. Um, you know, we need a supportive environment. Uh, we need an open door policy um, that, that we can advocate for each other. Um, it needs to be company-wide surveys within larger organizations and getting feedback. Um, I think we need to understand our different thoughts and experiences um, to gender discrimination and female marginalization. I think you know anonymous surveys can really help um, ease some of these you know questions, and then to have the feedback um, and and be transparent and and people not to feel uncomfortable to bring up issues to think that they're you know, causing an issue within an organization when they're presenting new ideas to help grow and um, you know, make that company better. I mean, the more diverse ideas, the more different people we have, the better a corporation or a private practice or anyone is. So I think just having a supportive environment and be able to talk about things like pay gap, maternity leave and, and other things are, are important. So here's some things that I thought uh, tips to succeeding. Um, you always want to be positive. You want to have that growth mindset. You know, the growth mindset uh, is people feel like, you know, you can always improve that failure is an opportunity to learn. Um, you know, you want to be assertive. You, you want to ask for a seat at the table. Um, you want to, you know, aspire to do something better. Be, you know, if you fail, you continue, you keep on growing. A lot of people that I see talk to, you know, they feel like they hinder and they had a bad experience, so they stop. But you want to try to be confident. You want to stay up to date again. You want to be a, a, a good learner. And, and, and the thing is, is sometimes, you know, you might have those obstacles. And, and I think the, the goal is to 
to succeeding is to be respected. You don't necessarily have to be liked by everyone, um, but to be respected is important. Um, and I think that, that kind of gets your seat at the table as well. So a lot of other things that uh, has been done in the industry and a lot of resources out there. Um, mentorship is, is important. Um, there are a lot of doctors out there that help do that and help, um, you know, young ODs succeed. Um, and I think we need to, you know, again, promote it. We, we have, you know, Women in Optometry Magazine promotes females that are doing great things in the industry, what, different things that they're doing, articles and things like that. Um, you know, sponsorship large organizations to sponsor and improve, empower women in the industry. They're, you know, sponsoring this event. That's great. Uh, Women Optometry Summit has an event. Um, you know, Optical Women's Association has events, they have that. So that's great. So the, the, you know, that has been able to bring women together, have aspiring, you know, conversations, be inspired and, um, you know, grow and, and learn from each other. And, you know, conferences, we need to expand the speaker panels in the industry. I again, like I said, with, with, with the pandemic, you know, everyone's qualified virtually, um, you know, it's easy to put the kids to bed and do a, a conference call or, or, or something at eight o'clock. So, and, and, and I think we just need to all, you know, encourage change. You know, it's not just one person, it's everybody. And even the smallest, you know, change makes a big difference for all of us in our future. Here is another concept um, that I wrote about in, in Women Optometry Magazine. You know, mentors are great, you know, but there is a difference. Um, you know, the mentor gives you feedback, guidance, and opportunities, but the sponsor is someone that has a powerful position that creates opportunity for you. So the mentor, you know, can map out your career trajectory, give you feedback, um, you know, help you reach more visibility within an organization, but to really advocate for the seat at the table and in a voice, you, you need a sponsor, right? The sponsor is someone that gives you opportunity to really grow because they have authority. Um, and again, there might not be enough sponsors because the leadership gap there with the females in the industry. This has shown that, you know, there is a, you know, awareness out there for uh, empowerment and, and to, you know, kind of give good mentorship, but there still lacks sponsor safety net um, compared to female, uh, male colleagues. So, um, you know, sponsors will enhance your career satisfaction, help you at the table, but that also transfers, um, you know, power to you, um, to the next generation and help grow optometry. But again, if there is, if there's a lack of a gap there, it's hard to transfer it over, um, to the next person. And, um, you know, an article in Harvard Business Review, a lack of sponsorship keeps women from advancing into leadership and really, again, can cause a deep disparity in our industry. So I'll go quick, we're running low on time here, but I think we need to support each other. I think it's more important than ever. We need to come together and support each other. We only lift each other up by bringing someone else up with us. And I think we're, there's a lot of great organizations out there that do that. Uh, Women in Optometry Magazine, great organization, a lot of great things out there um, to just, you know, be aspire, uh, inspired by what other females are doing. Uh, Optical Women's Association um, to kind of see what's going on with uh, leaders within corporations, opticians, optometry different. Uh, optometry Divas was, um, is a great organization, really uplifts you. Uh, they have a, um, an organization and they have CE events. Uh, OD Divas Facebook group has a lot of support there. And, 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 and there's a lot of different resources out there too, to kind of help, help you grow as well. And the industry is really expanded, right? Um, they recognize a lot of great females out there in the industry with the Optometry Divas Award, a Women in Optometry Thayer Award, which I just went to in Boston, uh, uh, you know, six months ago. It was very inspiring. Got to meet great females out there. It really brings people together. Women in Optometry, um, uh, sorry, Vision Monday, Most Influential Women in Optical. Uh, really spotlights these women. These people get confidence after they want to help other people. They want to grow. Um, Optical Women's Association Awards and GLOW, which is Global Ophthalmic Women. It's just starting. They're going to have um, an event in Spain coming up in June. So it brings uh, women from different uh, walks of life together, optometrists, um, and kind of help to kind of see what we you can do together to, to change. Um, because again, optometry is global. It's not just here in the U.S., um, and that organization is, is making great strides 
for optometry in the in the industry. And 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 so we've had a lot of progress over the years, but progress doesn't mean parity. Um, you know, we we're still underrepresented at the high levels of you know, academia and executive positions, and it. it with change, you know, we need more females um, entering in the industry. We need more change. And really change starts at the top, but it also starts with you. And, you know, we need to set goals and we need to collect data and, and, and we need to continue to advocate for each other to, to, to help grow our profession and, and, and create opportunities for uh, younger optometrists for, because the optometrists that we saw at the beginning that were the first have created opportunities for us today. Um, so I ask you, what else can you do for females in the industry to increase parity? And I think uh, uh, each one of us has the ability to make a change. Thank you. Wow, that was great, Maria. I mean, what an incredible presentation. I can tell, you know, you put so much hard work into this and, and just the statistics are, are really interesting. And, um, you know, I think a lot of us on here, men and women are, are probably pretty surprised at some of the statistics that you've shown. So this is really, really interesting. There are a few questions. A lot of people are, are, are wondering with the pay gap, as far as gender, you know, women versus men, is this taking into account that Maybe women aren't working as much or they're working part time. Maybe they enjoy being at home with their kids and maybe they're only working 20 hours a week instead of maybe a male's working 40 hours a week. Is, is all of that kind of taken into account when we're looking at this data? Yeah, there was a slide on that and um, the slide showed that working less hours, maybe work life balance and things like that. But when these studies were taking, they kind of accounted for most of the most of the things like the study from University of, of uh, Missouri optometry school kept everything the same there. Um, and I'm sure we'll have more data from women in optometry as they present as well today. Um, but usually they try to keep all the constants the same, even with the study with ophthalmology, um, Academy of Ophthalmology had the same data. They said everything was about the same. But if we took into not those things account, then yes, um, some women do work part time. Some optometrists that I talk to just want to work 30 hours. They're happy with that. Um, so there, that can account for some of it. Great. And even and Marjolyn is even commenting that the Jobson pay, pay gap data is on full time only. So thank you, Marjolyn, for that comment, because I think a lot of people um, ha ha are just kind of figure, wanting to know, you know, is this taken into consideration uh, when we're looking at the, the pay gap data? So that is very, very helpful. Thank you, Marjolyn. A few more questions here. Dr. McDowell wants to know, do you have any data on disparity in academia? So it was what I presented here, but I think the next couple of uh, presenters have that um, information. But the data that I had um, was just at the beginning. Um, but I think there, there, are le there are less dean uh, female optometrists uh, out there. But that's, that's what I have. Thank you. Um, another question. Is the gender pay gap for women ODs any better with federal employers like the VA? I don't know if you would know that or, you know, Marjolyn, if you're still listening, you can pop that in the chat. I can... If, if, if you, I, I would have no idea. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I think with the, again, with the study with um, University of Optometry, I think medical, that, and that must be under medical, uh, and they were mid section there um, was, was that where um, the largest was corporate, the mid was um, medical setting, and that must be under that, but they didn't identify exactly with that, with that study there. Mm hmm. Another question from Dr. Brill, what's the percentage of male to female MBAs? Uh, did you come across any of that in your research? That is, that is a good one. And, you know, um, that will be on the next time. I, that's a good uh, thing. But um, yeah, I, I think there are some female MBAs, but more male MBAs is my understanding. Just, you know, talking to people in the industry. I just don't have the data, but great question. Another great question from Dr. Brill, does the female leadership percentage differ with female CEO companies like with Sue Downs at My Eye Doctor? 
Yeah, I mean, the only one I looked in, in, into the industry, I tried to find, you know, the only one that I kind of really knew that was CEO was Sue Downs. Uh, the other females are more like uh, senior leadership positions, um, but that was that was the one that I kind of found myself. And but I only looked really into like, you know, corporate locations, um, you know, some optometrists, you know, that work together, but nothing like out there in the frame industry and things like that. But mostly that I found was really uh, Sue Downs being one of the female CEOs. Excellent. Uh, comment for an and question from Dr. Canto Sims. The new graduates need to see more women in leadership so they can identify with them and help propel them in better work environments, pay benefits and work life balance. How can I help or how can how can anybody listening in, you know, whether male or female, how can how can people listening help with with this this issue? Yeah, thank you so much. That's 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 so great that you know it inspired you to do this. Um, it, it's at all levels, right? So you find one optometrist that wants to be uh, wants help, wants to be mentored. You kind of do that. I'm happy to you know use my network to elevate and um, you know uh, get uh, ODs names out there. They're doing great things. I've I've had like uh, Facebook lives to kind of promote what females are doing. I've sent their information over to women in optometry. They've highlighted them. Um, so you can start as something small as mentoring them giving them resources. And then a lot is really confidence, giving them confidence to know that they can do that. And you're right. Um, if we, you can't see it, you can't be it, right? So if you're seeing that someone's a leadership a position in the industry and you can be that, what can you do? And then the mentor helps. And then once you kind of want to be there, you can ask them to be a sponsor um, for you to kind of, you know, how can I be like you? What can I do to help the industry? Uh, how can I help with, you know, ac extend it in academia? How can I step with uh, practices, um, you know, purchasing a practice, you know, having those biases when I'm you know, negotiating with a seller um, that might have a gender bias of what their legacy will be when they transfer this over maybe to you. Um, and I had those conversations when I purchased a practice, you know, a year and a half ago um, and, and, and really have grown it, the practice itself. Um, but, you know, it could, starts with anyone that is willing or motivated to do it can make a, small changes, make big strides in the long future. I love that. And I think that this presentation really shows there's lots of resources and ways that we can help. 